Let's just check that this is on. I, I'm quite embarrassed by that introduction, and I feel, feel that I'm really holding you up between some really good music and what I have to say. I think the other important thing is to recognize that I've been quite shocked to see a number of past students here. Some of them looking a hell of a lot older than when I last remembered them. And I must apologize because I bet you never thought you'd ever hear another lecture from me. But in all seriousness, it's fantastic to be here. I feel incredibly honored. It's very unusual that an engineer stands up in front of such an august crowd. Normally, we only speak to engineers. So it's fantastic to see all of you tonight. Folk, that picture wasn't chosen by me, and neither was the the video that you just saw. But we're going to work with that anyway. And the trick here is that lightning is something which is very, very frightening. It is very spectacular, and a lot of people understand it to be a frightening phenomenon that can injure and kill and do harm. But at the same time, it's a remarkably beautiful phenomenon. So what I want to try and do tonight, after having been guided by some very clever physicists, is not to try and bore you with too much of the fundamental physics, but speak about some of the beautiful stuff around the explanation of how lightning forms and why it actually does what it does. And in order to do that, I'm going to actually share with you some really remarkable videos of the invisible components of lightning, because it's that component, that fundamental formation part of lightning that defines what we as human beings ultimately see. And what we see is impressive, but what we don't see is a hell of a lot more impressive. So here we go in terms of what we're going to look at this evening. Um, We'll examine typical lightning flash, identifying key features, and it's important because it's what you see every day when you have a lightning storm, but I'll talk to you about what those things are. Remind ourselves why lightning forms in the first place. Why do we get lightning? You know, it's a very fundamental answer, but we need to answer that question. Four types of lightning, and I'm going to scare the living daylights out of you with some of those types of lightning because they don't do what we expect them to do. And then we'll see how lightning behaves and why it strikes objects. What is it that makes lightning get attracted to objects? Because it is attracted to objects. Why? Why does it strike the same place more than once? And why is there another kind of lightning that won't do that? And we'll, we'll have to think about that, especially if you live in a thatched roof house. Then I'll explain the two latest types of injury mechanisms that have been identified. And they're particularly pertinent because I was involved in both of these publications. And then the one of them I remember, and I'll just say it now so I don't have to say it again. We published the damn thing. We produced it and sent it in for publication a week before the team in Chicago whose bloody paper was printed before ours. But, you know, these things happen. We're now good friends. But I'll talk about that, and then we'll look at some of the real examples of damage, and that's just for fun. At the end, I mean, these are traumatic things, but it's fantastic to say, just look at this stuff up and see what went wrong. And we'll chuckle about it, but then please go away with something that you've gained by looking at a horrible experience and learning from it. But let's start with some general comments. I think the first thing is that People always associate Johannesburg with lightning. And very often I get a phone call from somebody in the media saying, does Johannesburg have the most lightning on the planet? And the truth of the matter is that, in fact, Johannesburg does have a very high lightning ground flash density. And that's what we quantify lightning with. NG, the number of times lightning strikes the earth per square kilometer per year. So any part of the planet, we actually know what that number is. We know how many times does lightning strike the earth per square kilometer per year, because the subtext of everything we talk about in lightning is the risk associated with the lightning strike. So the first thing we need to understand is how much lightning do we get, and more particularly, how much of it actually strikes the earth. The most important thing, however, is that Joburg doesn't by any means have the highest ground flash density on the planet. In fact, it's just vaguely above the international average vaguely above the international average. But the real deal is that we get high concentrations of industry in areas where the ground flash density exceeds 10 flashes per square kilometer per year, particularly Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, and we get high concentrations of people living in areas with high lightning ground flash density, which makes us quite unique. That combination of industry and people exposed to relatively high ground flash densities. And then if you're in industry, one of the things that we know is that when you have a lightning strike, very often you have massive problems. Your electrical systems fall over, your electronic systems fall over, and you have mayhem on the site. And one of the reasons is, the key thing about lightning, as you'll see later on, is its job is to find its way into the earth. All it wants to do is get into the earth. And when it gets into the earth, it sees an impedance, a resistance, an inductance, a capacitance. 
Because lightning itself is a current source, and this is quite intriguing, and it's always one of the examples we give to first-year electrical students. What the hell is a current source? You can't buy one. You can buy a voltage source. A battery is a good example of a voltage source. But a current source, what is this mysterious thing that causes current to flow no matter what? Well, lightning is a current source. The current will flow no matter what, and that current is defined by the process. And then depending on the impedance you put there, the voltage is created as a result of that impedance. So in South Africa, your challenge is we've got dry soil conditions, strong seasonal variation in soil resistivity, and generally high values of soil resistivity. So what happens is when the lightning current flows into the ground in South Africa, you get incredibly high voltages developed compared to many other parts of the world, where literally your soil resistivity is here, are orders of magnitude higher. So a lot of our research focuses on what happens in industry and how do we deal with that specific challenge. So it's that combination of high lightning activity, poor soil conditions, clustered populations, and areas of high economic activity, exposed operations. These are the things that make lightning so important in South Africa, and one of the reasons why we've got this very proud tradition of studying lightning over many, many decades here. Let's have a look at a lightning strike. This is a photograph by Dave Mackay, who is not a lightning photographer. This is almost a mistake. And he took this photograph over Devil's Peak in 2009. And it's quite clear what's going on here. The first thing is you've got downward branching. So you look at this lightning strike. This is what you would typically see if you walked out on a summer's night into a thunderstorm. You would see this shape of lightning branching downwards, starting at the top and branching as it moves down towards the earth. And that's a key in terms of what happened prior to us seeing this phenomena. So we'll talk about why that happens. Then you've got what looks like a three-dimensional element. Very often people say, but this is interesting. It looks like the lightning goes around in a little circle on itself. But of course that's three-dimensional. So what you're not seeing is the movement of that lightning strike towards you. And in fact, one of the big areas of study at the moment is for us to try and quantify what the horizontal movement of a lightning strike is. And there are many examples of that. One of the most horrific ones I was involved in was where the storm was 25 kilometers away from where the fellow was killed by a direct lightning strike. 25 kilometers. So you're minding your own business. Lightning is 25 kilometers away, and the next moment, you're dead. The only good thing is you don't remember that. And then there are these bits that go nowhere. If you look at a lightning strike as you see it, you'll see these terminating branches which seem to go absolutely nowhere. And then, of course, finally, there's the point of strike. At some point in time, lightning strikes an object on the ground, and we'll talk about why that happens. This type of lightning is called negative downward lightning. Negative downward lightning is by far the most common form of lightning that we experience in terms of lightning strike in the earth. 90% of all the lightning is of this form, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. So now the first important thing in terms of understanding lightning is that shape that you've just seen. Every phenomena there is part of an invisible process. And that invisible process is, of course, invisible to the human eye, but fortunately we can photograph it. So it's what happens before you see the big flash. And that big flash is called by, caused by what we call the return stroke, but it's how do we get to that point? And this is one of the most profound things to understand. It's very simple, but many students understand the concept of breakdown in air. You ionize the air. You create such a high voltage, such a high electric field in the air that you overcome the breakdown strength of the air. You strip away the electrons from the atoms and molecules, and you get an ionized plasma forming. And for those of you who are interested, if you take a uniform field, the breakdown strength of air is around about 30 kilovolts per centimeter. So if you've got a gap of one centimeter, you can put 30 kilovolts across that gap. And there you go. You'll get a flash. Now, way back when, when people started studying lightning, the assumption was that this process, this invisible process, must be caused by a voltage between the cloud and the ground. And a lot of very clever physicists got together, and they calculated the voltage that you would need and then they proved that you couldn't ever get lightning because the voltage was so absolutely enormous. But the point is, that's not the process. The process isn't about the voltage at all. So let's look at that process. The first thing, quite interesting, but you have to have a thundercloud. So a cumulonimbus cloud is the first thing you need. And the reason you need that thundercloud for lightning is the following. You start, oh, sorry, of course, you have to have a target, otherwise it's boring. But I mean, the point is that what you get is inside the thundercloud, you tend to get charge separation. Now this charge separation, very simplistically put, 
you get a dipolar structure, a lot of positive charge near the top, a concentration of negative charge at the minus 10 or minus 15 degree isotherm around about there, and at the base you get a little accumulation of positive charge. Now the interesting thing here is the reason you get this charge separation is really simple. You get these massive thermal updrafts in these cumulonimbus clouds, and quite literally, you get friction, and the components carrying the positive charge are lighter and they float to the top, and the components carrying the negative charge tend to sink down. And that's why you tend to get this structure of a cloud. Now, the other important thing to bear in mind is, obviously, up at the top there, there's the ionosphere. And, of course, you get lightning between the clouds and the ionosphere as well. We don't worry too much about that unless you fly space shuttles and things. But the point is, those are sprites, and you get those as well. We won't talk about those tonight. But I'm an engineer, and we like to keep things simple. The cloud is best approximated as a dipole. Strong positive at the top, strong negative at the bottom. And that is what we're typically faced with. So you typically have the base of the thundercloud be negatively charged. And as a result of that, of course, the structure, the object on the ground, is positively charged. And by the way, if the cloud were to move horizontally during a storm, you would trace this positive charge traveling along the surface of the Earth. And that positive charge would be detected as current in cables, in pipelines, in farmers' fences, and so forth. But that's the structure that we look at. Now, the interesting thing is this. What is it that inspires this negative charge to begin to leave the base of the cloud? Now, remember what I said. That picture I showed you was negative downward lightning, and I said that's the most common form. So here's what goes on in the thundercloud. At the base of the cloud, this is the incredible concentration of negative charge. So no voltage, negative charge. So you've got this concentration of negative charge. That concentration of negative charge, of course, has around it a very high electric field. And the point is that that high electric field associated with the concentration of charge up there in the thundercloud results in localized ionization of the air around the base of that cloud. So now what you have happening is you've got this huge concentration of charge. Once you've got enough you've got sufficient electric field to begin an ionization process. Now, of course, what happens is that process starts in that charge center at the base of the cloud. As that air ionizes, self-respecting electrons seeing negative charge there are driven away. So what happens is those negative electrons that have been released by that concentration of charge in the E field begin to accelerate away from the base of the cloud, driven by the base negative charge. And of course, as those negative electrons are driven away, they strike into other atoms and molecules, and that's called ionization by collision. So as they impact on other atoms and molecules driven by their speed, they cause more ionization. So now as this process moves away, you're getting a continuous ionized stream leaving the cloud. There is a problem, however, but that's the point. So as we move away, this process leaves the cloud and you get ionization. Now, let's have a look at that in more detail. So here's the thing. There's the base of the cloud. There's this charge leaving the cloud, which we call the stepped leader. But as the charge moves away from the base of the cloud, the linear charge density begins to decrease because the impact of this charge forcing it away slows down the acceleration until you get to the point where the charge is moving so slowly that it no longer ionizes air molecules. So this negative charge moves away, accelerates, and actually for a moment pauses. But as it pauses, of course, what happens is it's almost as if you've dropped a copper wire from the base of the cloud. And what happens is you get this linear decreasing charge density, and charge moves now from the charge center down that channel as if it was a piece of copper wire. And guess what happens? It begins to concentrate at the tip. So that charge is slowly driven away down that conductive path, this plasma that's forming, and it then starts to accumulate at the tip. And of course, what happens next is absolutely predictable. You get a high enough concentration of charge for the process to start all over again. So once again, you get ionization. Now, before I draw the picture, the point is this. That ionization that takes place there won't necessarily be in a straight line because it depends probabilistically on where the first ionization occurs. If the first ionization were to occur in that direction, well, this, the leader would progress in that direction, at least for a while. But the point is that as this process carries on, it repeats. And, most importantly, it can branch. 
And that is why you see lightning when it's moving downward. And this is the invisible part, branching downwards. Because as that initial needle leaves the cloud, it pauses, the charge builds up. This is all very quick, of course. The charge builds up, and then it ionizes again, and the process repeats. And it can branch. It can do anything it like. It can follow a completely meandering path. And as I said, one of our interests is, what is the horizontal distance, for example, that can be covered by this? And then it gets to the bottom of the cloud, and so the process continues. This branching downward direction is almost arbitrary. Just by the way, if you walked outside and you stood in the thunderstorm, 80%, 80% of all the lightning you see would be inter or intra cloud, up in the clouds. Only 20% gets lost like this and ends up on the earth. But of course, that's the 20% that's interesting because that's the part that affects us the most. But now what I'd like to do is have a look at a video. And before we run the video, what I want to show you here is or explain to you is that this is 7,000 frames a second, and this is able to expose the invisible component. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the negative charge leader leaving the cloud, traveling down towards the earth. You're going to see it branching dramatically. And then you're going to see one hell of a flash. And that flash, of course, is the return stroke, and that's what you see. So as a human, all we would see is the return stroke, that bright flash that you see imprinted on the sky at night. Here, all you'll see is the screen go white as this happens. But I want you to watch this, and I want you to watch particularly the tip of the advancing leader, where you can see that massive charge concentration ionizing the air ahead of it. And again, I want to emphasize, the point here is this process requires absolutely no voltage whatsoever between the cloud and the ground. This process creates its own electric field based only on the charge in the process. And that's what's so interesting about the lightning phenomena. It requires no voltage. So, Professor Nixon, Ken, I wonder if you could just push the button and let's watch this thing. So look at that. Moving down from the top of the cloud, and then finally there's a point of strike. Now, the other thing that you must understand is that if you go outside and you look at a typical lightning flash, a lightning flash consists of multiple strokes. So if you keep watching this, what you'll see is there's a channel that's been formed which has gone quiet now, we can't see it, but that channel has been established, so there's a plasma, and then what happens is, once you've got a discharge from the base of the cloud to the ground, another charge center can discharge down the same channel repeatedly, so you get these multiple strokes, and each stroke is carrying the charge from a particular charge center down that same channel to the earth, so that's the important thing, you do get lightning strikes where there's only a single stroke in the flash, but most lightning strikes have multiple strokes in the flash because they're making use of that existing path there. And then let's do another one, move to the next one. So this is important, and I think before we run this one, just have a look at this. This was taken on the 6th of April this year from Northcliffe Ridge. And if you look very, very carefully, it's quite hard to see, but that's the, that is the Brixton Tower there, that's the Hillbrow Tower, and this is the SABC building seen from Northcliffe Ridge. This is using the same cameras as the previous photographs. They were by a fellow called Tom Warner, with whom we work in the United States and have had a very good collaboration with. He's been very kind to our students. We've now got his cameras here. This is running at 15,000 frames per second. And again, I want you to watch this. So this is taken this month from Northcliffe Ridge. So have a look at this. And what is spectacular, of course, you can't see that at all. You can't see that at all. And once the return stroke is caused, the current will flow, the real current between the cloud and the ground flows for typically tens to hundreds of microseconds. That's all. But it's bloody spectacular if it's flowing through your body, okay? So that's the important point. <laughs> and here again, we'll see multiple flashes. And uh, I must just explain to you, we need to just put this on the table. This is a, a, a postdoc who's joined us from Brazil working with one of our staff members Coincidentally, they're married to each other. And um, what you'll see is down here, and they're trying to identify what it is. But if you look on Google Maps, you can actually see townhouse developments down here. And I think the theory is that one of the trees down here was actually... What, there you can see that glowing down there. The, we think that that's one of the trees that's been struck by the lightning, which is actually spectacular. But that's amazing. Now, 10 years ago, you couldn't do this. So 10 years ago, we were theorizing about what was happening. Now we can photograph this thing and actually show students what goes on. So let's move on. Then the other important thing is, let's just bring Vitz into this for a moment. This is the same image that you're going to see. So there's the, the Hillbrow Tower, the Brixton Tower, and the SABC building. 
Then on the Chamber of Mines building on West Campus, we've got electric field measuring devices. So what we do is we measure the electric field at all times. And the interesting thing, of course, is this is a photograph from Northcliffe. We are measuring the electric field on the Chamber of Mines building here at Wits University. And the interesting thing is, of course, you can correlate these things. And that's one of the most important things about modern lightning investigation. We are able to use electromagnetic theory to measure and really interpret more of what's going on. So, Ken, if you could run this one. What I want you to watch is the correlation between the flashes and, of course, the electric field pulses. There's a double pulse coming now. And so this thing can run, and it allows us to actually get a handle on what's happening in the electric field environment, what's happening with the current that's flowing, and how does that relate to the actual lightning that we see. Now, as a normal human being looking at this, it just looks spectacular. But I can assure you, if your industrial plant is underneath this thing, it's kind of the stuff that keeps you awake at night. And if you're on a golf course and this is happening, and I think this video was taken just after midday, by the way, so if you were on a golf course while this was happening, that's also something to think about quite, quite seriously. So that was a negative flash over Johannesburg. Right, now let's talk about the four types of lightning. I think this is very important as well. The type that we've spoken about up to now is this negative downward lightning. Negative charge at the base of the cloud, positive charge at the top, quite logical. Negative charge moves downward. You will see negative downward branching, and now forevermore you can see that. The branching is downward. We know it's downward lightning, but the downward component is the part we can't see. Then you have positive downward lightning. Now, positive downward lightning is very interesting. Typically, and just see if this works for you guys, when you've been experiencing a, a summer thunderstorm, you hear all the thunder, you see all the lightning, and then normally, not normally, but very often it goes quiet for a moment. And you get the sense that the storm is over, and you breathe deeply and all those important things. And then the next moment, and the technical word is you hear one a bang. Okay? <laughs> And that Murava bang is a positive strike. And the reason for that is very simple. Obviously, you get a lot of lightning inside the cloud, but at the end of the storm, some of it is discharged from the base of the cloud to ground. So you've, dis you've depleted all the negative charge here. So at the end of the storm, when the thing's just running out of energy, you end up with a predominance of positive charge at the top of the cloud, very little negative charge at the base. And now you get a leader that's initiated not from the negative charge center, but from the positive charge center, which, by the way, we most are initiated from. And instead of being intercepted in the negative charge region, it actually continues right down to the ground. That's quite interesting. It's rare, and I'll tell you why a moment later why that's a very good thing. And then, of course, you get upward lightning. Positive and negative upward lightning. The important thing about upward lightning, I'll show you a video in a second, is that upward lightning is associated with very tall, slender structures. The reason for that is you've got to have a high enough electric field on the earth to initiate the upward leader. Now, in the thundercloud, because you get this massive charge separation due to the formation of the cumulonimbus cloud, that's easy to understand. But on the earth... The reason that you've got an electric field here is because of the presence of the thundercloud. So this object has to really modify that electric field substantially in order to initiate an upward leader. The bottom line is, in terms of the way we understand and the way we protect against lightning, is the energy levels with, of these are relatively low compared to negative and positive downward lightning. A couple of observations. The first one is negative downward lightning, 90%. Of all the lightning strike in the Earth is negative downward, will strike the tallest object. So pick a tall buddy when you play golf in a thunderstorm, okay? That's the important thing, because negative downward lightning will strike the tallest object. If you've got a thatched roof house, the reason you stick a mast up next to it is the theory is the lightning will strike the mast and not the thatched roof. That's the principle. And it's absolutely scientifically defensible, and it works. Yeah, the problem with positive downward lightning is it doesn't strike the tallest object at all. It just doesn't. Positive downward lightning, which is rare, 2 to 4% of all lightning striking the Earth is positive downward lightning, the rest is upward. Positive downward lightning does not strike the tallest object. It will travel down past the side of a high-rise building and strike the road next to it. But there's another problem. Positive downward lightning is incredibly energetic compared to negative downward lightning. So when you get positive lightning, that mood of a bang, it's highly energetic. It literally will blow craters out of airport runways, and I've had the privilege of looking at one at OR Tambo to say, well, that's very impressive. It upsets pilots, I'm told. So the point is, positive downward lightning 
is hugely energetic, it's relatively rare, and it doesn't strike the tallest object. So if you're in a thatched roof house and you have a mast, best you don't have positive downward lightning. And then these uh, upward lightning, low energy, typically structures which are 60 to 100 meters taller than the objects around them. Then what I'd like to do before we run this, just explain what happens. This is upward flashes in Johannesburg, also taken from North Cliff Ridge this month. Again, please understand, upward lightning, what you'll see is, this is the invisible component, because it starts on the ground and moves up, you will see the branching start moving upwards. So as you're driving down the M1 at 5 k's an hour one evening, and it's thunder and lightning, and you're looking at the Hillbrow Tower, keep an eye on that tower, and the taxis, of course, but keep an eye on the tower <laughs> for the upward lightning, and you'll see it branching upwards from those towers. So here, what you need to also appreciate is, remember I said that for upward lightning to start on an object on the ground, you need this incredibly high electric field. So very often what we find is nothing happens until somewhere there's a lightning strike to an earthed object. And that causes a perturbation in the electric field just sufficient to initiate the upward leaders. So if we can run this video, you'll actually see, and we'll, you can't see the structures, but we'll tell you what they are. So you can actually see what happens. Upward streamers start simultaneously from three objects on the Joburg skyline. And they're a good couple of kilometers apart. So let's have a look at this. So there, there was the flash off screen. Look at that. Wrexham Tower, the SABC Tower, and of course the, the Hillbrow Tower. And there they go. And finally you'll start to see branching. There you go. Branching begins up there. And finally it'll reach the base of the cloud, and you'll get your return stroke, and you'll actually see that flash, which is what we associate with lightning. And so it goes. But the important thing here is to appreciate, this is, this is not common. It's from these tall structures. This is the SABC building, Brixton Tower. We don't know why it keeps striking the SABC building. And, of course, the uh, <laughs> Hillbrow Tower. And there it is. Absolutely beautiful. And this is gone in the twinkling of an eye. The current flows for tens to hundreds of microseconds. The only reason you see it is your eye remembers that intense light. But here we can see it in extreme detail. So those are upward flashes. Now let's say a few things about the ground flash density. So South Africa, and this is very interesting, was one of the very, very first countries that began to quantify the lightning ground flash density because you had sort of mad scientists and engineers who were interested in this stuff. And also because we started de developing this very large electrical utility, which is now called ESKIM. And we were particularly interested in the influence of lightning. So what happened back in the day and I've had the absolute privilege of even publishing a paper with the fellow who drove this project literally, I mean, I want to say 100 years ago, but decades ago. The point is this. This is the ground flash density across South Africa. It's a relatively accurate map made by a couple of folk working out of the National Electrical Engineering Research Institute at the CSIR. They set up sensors around the country. They set up a beautiful mast in the CSIR, which has since been dismantled and sent to Brazil, which is fine. And this is what they got, and this is the interesting thing. If you look at Gauteng, you can see sort of where the ground flash density sits. Somewhere between six and nine flashes per square kilometer per year. You get very high intensity along the, the Drakensberg, and that makes sense because you get lightning not because of what's in the ground. You get lightning because of the tendency of that area to have thunderstorms. And those thunderstorms are always caused when you've got some reason for hot air to rise and to be forced up, to, force the, to form those cumulonimbus clouds. And that's what happens. So you can always see wherever you get lots of storm clouds, you will get a lot of lightning. And as usual, absolutely nothing happens in Cape Town. <laughs> then, the other important thing to appreciate is that, and I'm, I'm sure they're never going to show this video anywhere, okay? But it's okay. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story in a moment. But the interesting thing, of course, is as you saw, we were able to measure the electric field associated with those lightning strikes over that, we've, that we videoed from Northcliffe, and we can absolutely correlate those electric field measurements with the actual incidence of lightning. What that means, of course, is that lightning, because it's this impulsive current, radiates electric, electromagnetic energy. And you can detect that with antennas. So the point is this. Obviously... If you've got an incidence of lightning over there, you can obviously measure with a number of sensors, let's say three sensors, the radiation that's been received from that lightning strike. And what that means is we can triangulate. So we can go back and say, if I've got multiple sensors receiving that impulse, I can decide whether this is from the same event or not. And I can say, okay, that's a single lightning event. Therefore, where was it located? Then, based on the electromagnetic fields that I measure... I can work backwards and say, and therefore, this is what the current was. 
By the way, I can also say whether it's negative or positive, upward or downward, and I can measure all of that. And of course, that's exactly what we now do. So whereas, and I, I, I kid if you not, if you go back to this map, that entire map was based on maybe 5,000 measurements, which is probably what we've done, as I said, the last sentence across South Africa. And that's the important point to appreciate. So we've got this process, we can do it. And then, of course, what happened in 2006, the South African Weather Service installed the South African Lightning Detection Network. 26 sensors across South Africa and into Swaziland, we now measure probably 98% of every single lightning event in South Africa. And of course, what that does is it gives us truckloads of data, which isn't information, by the way, it's just data, which we then have to analyze and start turning into useful data. The trouble is, as soon as we started analyzing that data, and the weather service must be commended because they plowed through this stuff, it started to tell us all sorts of deeply, deeply disturbing things. And here are some of them. So that's the new map developed by the South African Weather Service. Now, so what? I, I, by the way, I'm colorblind, and I have to assume it's got different colors on it, but there it is. But the point is this. If you look at the ground flash density back in the day, the interesting thing between the old map and the new map is that in the old map, in Gauteng, you had somewhere between six, and six to nine flashes per square kilometer per year. When you start looking at the new map, there are a couple of interesting observations. The first one is that the trend is absolutely the same. So you tend to get high lightning where we used to get high lightning. The second important thing is to understand that lightning is also governed by the sunspot cycle. So you need to look at a lightning measurement over around about 11 years. And we're kind of getting relatively close to that now. So we're now starting to become confident in this data. But here's the problem. The ground flash densities that we are now detecting across South Africa are significantly higher than they were based on the old map. And remember, we did all our designs based on the old map. So lightning is a risk management process. You can't eliminate the risk of lightning, but you can quantify it. So you can say to a bloke who walks outside, this is what your chance of getting struck by lightning is, and it's helpful. Okay? But now, what we've discovered is the risk is clearly significantly higher than we thought. And I think that's the important thing. So intuitively, the more lightning, the greater the risk, and that's a fact. Risk is associated with the strikes to an object on the ground, and we need to know how lightning behaves and why it strikes objects, what makes it attracted to objects. But the important thing to appreciate is this. There's no doubt that one of the reasons we're detecting more lightning is that we're better at measuring it. So now we're measuring all the lightning, we're getting all the data. I can assure you that in the construction of that first map, and this, isn't a, this is a true story, some of the data that gave incredibly high values of lightning ground flash density were discarded because they were considered to be out of line with what was being anticipated and expected. And that's a good scientific principle, and scientists do that. They discard data, and they publish their work, and then they put that data back in, and they publish it again. And you get two papers. It's fantastic. Okay, but the point is this. The first thing is we're measuring better, and therefore the measurement is more accurate. The second one is, and this is substantiated by satellite photography and research across the Earth. There is no doubt that we are detecting more lightning on planet Earth and since it's the only planet we reside on, we take that quite seriously. So lightning activity tends to be increasing across the Earth. Now, there's a fellow, famous lightning scientist called Colin Price, whose brother runs a university far away from here. And Colin has a beautiful phrase, and he says, the best way of taking the temperature of the Earth is to measure how much lightning there is. And that's something that I think we need to consider. Now, let's have a look at this. So there you've got lightning. This is that same thing. The question is, what defines this point of strike? What, well, there you go, it's sound effects and everything. And I said to the guys, I'll turn the sound off. But the question is, what is it that defin defines the point of strike? And this is fundamentally important. Why does lightning strike the mast, negative downward lightning? Why does it strike the mast next to the thatched roof house and not the thatch? You know? So here's the thing. Negative charge at the base of the cloud, positive charge on the object on the ground, and of course, as this charge moves away from the crowd, negative charge is effectively lowered close to the object on the ground. And of course, as this negative charge approaches, you get an intensification of the electric field on the object of, on the ground. Now, please take note of the following very important point. This upward leader here, which forms from the object on the ground, is formed because the electric field suddenly becomes incredibly high. But it only becomes high because this charge has been lowered from the cloud to somewhere within the proximity of the object on the ground. Now, the key thing here is this. This is very important, and people struggle with this sometimes. The point is this. It doesn't say too much about that object. It could be conductive. It could be a dielectric. 
All it's got to do is modify the electric field so that the presence of a rising charge, arriving charge causes an increased divergence of the electric field. The fundamental issue is, although if it was a conductor, you could start measuring current pulses in it. If it was a tree with the same dimensions, you would start to get the same electric field divergence at the tip of the tree as you would at the tip of a metal mast that looked the same shape as the tree. The key thing is, this process, all of this, is ionization in the air. It doesn't necessarily rely on massive charge injection from the object on the ground. That helps, but it doesn't rely on that. It relies on the fact that if I could take a high enough electric field here in front of my face, I could create a plasma and I could ionize the air. Where's Andrew Forbes who does that thing? We did that crazy experiment where we ionized, we created plasma in the laboratory using lasers, which is, by the way, a fun thing to do in a party, just create this plasma in the air. But the point is, ultimately, you could, for instance, trigger lightning like that, just by the way. So you've got to create that plasma, and this is what happens. Up it goes, and you start to get this process reaching out to intercept, and this is the concept of attraction, to intercept that downward moving charge. Now, the interesting thing is this. Obviously, we now can talk about the attractive radius of an object, and in the engineering context, we do that all the time. What is the attractive radius of this building? So if it's your building and you're in it and you're interested, we can calculate that. Over what distance is lightning attracted? There is a problem, of course. The attractive radius is clearly a function of a couple of things. Number one, the height of the structure. That kind of makes sense. I mean, the closer the object is to the lightning, well, the more the attractive radius. And that's why a taller object tends to attract more than a lower object. But the other important thing is that attractive radius is also a function of how much charge actually exists in that downward moving leader. That makes sense. So if I had this downward moving leader over here and it had very little charge, you wouldn't launch that upward leader. But if I had the downward leader over there with a huge amount of charge, you'd possibly create a high enough electric field for this leader to move a greater distance and intercept and attract lightning to this object. So the higher the current that's ultimately going to flow in the lightning strike, the bigger the distance over which that strike is going to be attracted to the object. For example, your home, which is a comforting sort of thought. And of course, from all of this, we can calculate the attractive radius of any object. And by the way, obviously what we do is we simulate this using statistical techniques accounting for every type of lightning you can get. But you can calculate, calculate the attractive radius of an object. And that means that you can actually determine precisely how many times any object will be struck per year. And again, that's a nice number to know because it tells us what we need to do in terms of protecting it. How do we manage and control that risk? Your risk is different, for example, at a nuclear power station compared to, for example, a regular residential house. Very different risks, and we need to understand that in terms of the way we design the protection. So now what I want you to see is I want you to see this attract... Oh, this is brilliant. The, the wine arrives when I'm supposed to start wrapping up, I believe so. So... The key thing here is what I want you guys to watch is this is, again, one of Tom Warner's videos. That is a mast standing on a mountain. You are going to see the negative downward leader, and then you're going to start to see, all this is the, the invisible process, the formation of the upward positive leader to intercept the downward moving leader and then result in the lightning strike. And remember, this is the key thing. This is the reason the launch of that upward leader is the reason that lightning strikes the object at all. And this is what we have to remember. When you're designing lightning protection, you want to make absolutely sure that that leader that goes up and intercepts is from your lightning protection system and not from a sensitive piece of your equipment. So, Ken, if you don't mind, let's run the video. And I want you to pay attention to what happens over here as the charge starts moving down. So keep focusing on that. Look at that. This is kind of boring because it's directly above, but the same thing would apply if it wasn't. And then watch, of course, one of these, one of these branches becomes the strike. So there's the one that, that connected. The others have vanished. The charges collapse, recombinations taken place, gone. But you would have seen that massive branching image and you wouldn't have been aware at all of this upward process that led to that strike. And again, as with all of them, you'll see multiple strokes onto that single point of attachment. And then this is a photograph by our postdoctoral student working with our partners in Brazil. This is Sao Paulo. And what I want you to see here is two buildings. They're not that tall. They're only 50 meters high. And what you're going to see is upward leaders leaving both buildings 
One wins the race, one makes the connection, and that's the building that gets struck. And again, the principle is you want the one that wins the race to be from your protection system and not from your head or your air conditioning system. So, Ken, if you could play that. So, watch that. There they go. Bang. One wins the race, and that's the one that won the race. And that defines the point of strike. And by the way, what is interesting about these particular buildings is that every single parameter associated with a lightning strike in that building is measured. So they can tell you what current flowed through the reinforcement of that building and so forth. And this is the very important stuff if you're trying to design optimal systems. Right, lightning can damage but also injure and kill. And I think that's the important thing. And I'm going to spend a few moments on injury and killing, but I'm not going to show you the bad stuff, okay? I'm just going to talk about it because I'm not a medic. I'm an engineer. I've had the privilege of working with a forensic pathologist who did his PhD for me. It's truly frightening, but good work. So this is the Irene Dairy Farm in Pretoria. Many of you may remember this event. Cows are quite dumb. They stand under trees in thunderstorms, and this is what happened, and they all died. And they died because of step potentials. So the voltage on the earth during the flow of the lightning current between their forelegs and their hind legs is completely different. And of course, some of the current now flows up through the body, through the heart, and fibrillates the heart, and the animals die. This is ferning on human skin after a direct strike to an individual. This person survived, by the way. Otherwise, I wouldn't show you this. And again, talk about the six mechanisms. Six mechanisms of injury due to lightning. The first one is obvious. You walk outside, lightning strikes you. It's terribly unfortunate. You don't always survive that. But you, if you do, you tell a lot of stories. Okay, so a direct strike is obvious. The second one is a side flash. Now, that's an interesting phenomenon because what it means is Classic injury mechanism, and that's why you don't want to stand under a tree in a thunderstorm. Because imagine that this lid of the piano was struck by lightning. So lightning strikes the lid of the piano, and the current flows through the piano into the ground. And I'm standing over here minding my own business. But of course, the piano presents an impedance. So as the current flows through it, you create a voltage. You create a voltage between the ground and this point here. And it might get to a high enough level to create enough electric field there to initiate a leader, which then travels towards me and strikes me. So very often, people under trees are struck on the upper parts of their body due to the side flash. That's quite a nice one to understand. Don't stand next to trees in thunderstorms. The step potential, also very clear. Lightning strikes the piano. The current flows into the ground, and it disperses away from the piano. And of course, as it disperses away, the current travels through an increasing volume of soil. The cross-sectional area through which it flows gets larger and larger and larger, as a result of which the impedance moving away gets lower and lower, so you get this almost exponential drop in voltage between your two feet as the current flows between your feet. And here's the problem. The current flows up one leg through your chest cavity, if you're lucky, down the other leg, and fibrillates the heart. So you get these two feet on the ground, and you get a step potential, and you can be very badly hurt. The fourth one is touch, where I'm touching the piano, even over there while it was struck by lightning. So I'm inside an industrial environment. There's an I-beam. I'm touching the I-beam. Lightning strikes it, and there's sufficient potential, not for a flash, but for a current to flow through my body and injure me. But the two I want to talk about are the two which have been published by Wits University in collaboration with colleagues in many places, including Pretoria University. The one is the upward streamer mechanism. Remember, you saw those upward streamers start? You saw two buildings. The one intercepted. The other one vanished. Where did it go? It collapsed back into the building, and you can measure the current flowing through the building. So the, the principle here is what happens if an upward streamer initiated itself from your head and lightning struck something else? What happens to the charge as it flows back through your body? And that's the key thing. And then barotrauma, the fact that it's a massive blast effect due to lightning. So let's look at the first one. The first one's upward streamer, very simple. You get the upward leader initiated from the tree, you get that initial streamer activity, finally you get a strike, and the question is, what would happen if this charge didn't form a lightning strike but simply collapsed back through the structure on the ground or the human body? And of course, that's exactly the principle. So the principle is, as you've seen, when you've got multiple objects on the ground and the, and the arrival of negative downward charge, you get massive number of upward streamer activity, but also you can get that from people. And that's exactly what happened in the work that allowed us to really prove without a doubt this effect. So Joma Cosmos, Morocco Swallows, 1998. The key thing to look out for here, and it's written on the side, but the key thing here was to understand these guys were badly injured. 
The story that the losing team is always the most badly injured isn't true at all. The key thing here was a lot of these players were not standing with two feet on the ground. So it couldn't have been the step potential. One of the injured players was actually airborne at the time. So we are talking about an effect which didn't rely on contact between the ground at all. The, second, the, the third important thing is we know where the lightning struck. So we know exactly where the lightning struck. It didn't strike the players directly. The question, therefore, was what happened. And this was conclusive evidence of the upward streamer mechanism. So let's play that video, please. And watch the reaction of the players and watch their heads. Watch how they grab their heads after this event. Now, just you'll see the injured players, and I'll do this again in a larger screen. So this was terrible. The hearts were fibrillating. These people were dying on the field. The work we published was co-authored by the team doctor of uh, Joma Cosmos, by the way. So we had full medical records. Look at, the, look at the reaction of the players. Absolutely shocking. But this showed no direct strike to the players, no step potential, but they were electrically injured. And this was clear evidence, the first clear evidence of the upward streamer mechanism. Let's go to the next. This is the terrible part. So let's move to the next video. So here it is again. Now what I want you to watch is I want you to look at the Iwisa sign over there. Look at the dust cloud. A cloud of dust forms over there, which is clearly where the strike occurred. So we also know that it wasn't to the players themselves. So this is a phenomenal and profound proof of the theory of the upward streamer. And the health of these folk has been traced ever since. And the way we analyzed this was you had to take this damn thing frame by frame and analyze every single frame and correlate that with the actual lightning activity. Um, and that's what we were able to do. And then the last one, barotrauma, done uh, with us, with a forensic pathologist at Pretoria University, who's experienced after lightning injury, bleeding ears, uh, internal damage to organs, and all of, those, all of that damage isn't electrical in nature at all. It's like blunt force trauma. So it's a question of what happens. And of course, it's kind of obvious in that you get this massive pressure wave, you get supersonic blasts, which translates into thunder, and of course, that can also literally damage people and blow them away. So uh, our colleague has been able to quantify exactly what that effect is. But what it also means is, five years ago we had four, five years ago we had five, ten years ago we had four, now we've got six mechanisms of injury, which again allows us to quantify the risk better. And that's the important thing. So we understand that there are at least six mechanisms, two of which have a strong South African flavor, understanding them profoundly influences our ability to accurately quantify risk, and it's evident that safety is not just about lightning protection systems. I've got colleagues here from industry. It's equally about how people behave during a storm, and it implies the need for lightning professionals to understand how behavior is affected, and that a proper lightning protection system factors this in. But what is quite fun to wrap this up is just to look at damage, since the people involved aren't here. So here's the first one. This is Bedford View. <laughs> okay. um, now, you've got to visualize this. A lot of dear people drinking tea in a clubhouse. Now, imagine it. It's wonderful. That is a TV antenna. The problem was that nobody bothered to earth the TV antenna. Now, given what I've told you, and you have a lightning strike, it's kind of obvious that that's going to get struck. It's a good reason to make sure. Go home and check that your TV antenna has been earthed, by the way. It should be. So lightning strikes this thing, and self-respecting lightning travels down and wants to make its way into the ground. Here's what happened. The coaxial cable ran down the mast, across the knock of the roof, and into the roof over there. And you can see what happened. Now, you were inside. Imagine the bang that you heard. But it wasn't just the bang. This is what happened inside. Okay, so that's the ceiling. So you had massive arcing and flashing in the ceiling. Barrow trauma for the ceiling. That's how you change a light bulb really quickly. This, by the way is the cable, the, the 50 hertz cable, that's the light switch. This is chasing, where it was chased into the wall. So the electrician comes, cuts a groove into your concrete, puts the cable in, plasters over it. Took him a couple of minutes, this took a couple of microseconds, blew right out of the wall. Can you imagine how that tea party went after that? This is Loskop Dam. The situation here is very interesting. The problem was the gutters weren't earth. And I mean, there's a funny story, which was, and it's true, it was a Sunday morning and there was a lady lying in bed on a Sunday morning, a bit stormy, and the next thing, you've got a hole through your curtains. And you start reevaluating your life. But the point is this, lightning struck the tree outside the building, the gutters were within a flashing distance, so we got a side flash, 
The gutters weren't earthed, so what did the self-respecting lightning do? It flashed through the window to the bishop strips, these aluminium strips in the roof. Flashed right through, blew a hole through the curtain. Now at this point, everybody's awake. Flashes to the bishop strip across the roof, and it then got itself into the electrical system and damaged a number of units at that resort. Tree, we've just had an MSE completed on how a tree behaves during lightning because the current doesn't flow for very long, but the problem is a tree is quite simply not a good conductor. So as lightning strikes it, you get this massive arcing within the interstices of the tree, causes vaporization of moisture to some extent, but it causes arcing, which causes that rapid expansion of the air, and it's that which blasts the tree apart, and that's what you get. I've got a lovely piece of wood in my office which was found 50 meters from the tree. And then telephone poles. So bottom line is you don't really want to be talking on a landline in a thunderstorm. And true story, this is the house at the end of the thunderstorm, at the end of the telephone line. The mistake here was a telephone line went in directly into the thatch. So you don't want to do that. Okay? So that is the house at the end of that telephone line. This is a, a mast. So this is what you do. You put up a mast next to your thatched roof house. There's the base of the mast. It's good practice to earth the mast. If you forget to earth the mast and it's finally struck by lightning, the self-respecting lightning, whoopsie, go back, the self-respecting lightning actually starts looking for the earth, and in this case it flashed right into the earthing system of the house and destroyed every appliance in the house. Okay? And then that's just a corner of a building missing again. Every appliance was dead. And this is nice, very cute. This is out Edenvale Way just the other day because what you can now do with the, lightning, with the South African Lightning Detection Network is you can get, this is the thunderstorm activity at that time. And what you do is you can look at the distance from this location and you can look at the lightning and you can actually correlate in time and distance exactly the lightning strike which did that to the house. And you can go to the owner and say, you'll be interested to know that this was a negative strike of 95 kilo amps at 5.40 the afternoon. He's quite happy about it. Okay. And that, of course, is the point. In conclusion, Gauteng is a fairly high lightning ground flash density. The lightning flash develops because it creates its own electric field, making the path complex and often long. Nothing to do with voltage. Lightning strikes an object because of the launch of the upward leader, which goes, moves up to intercept it. Ground flash density appears to be increasing across the planet, by the way, not just in bad areas. And six injury mechanisms have been identified. Damage due to lightning can, of course, be considerable, and modern techniques allow us to locate lightning strikes and record all of the associated data. As a lightning researcher, we think this is incredibly exciting, by the way. So there you go. Thank you very, very much. And, and, and again, I register my apologies to my students who had to sit through another lecture on. So I, I recognize some people I haven't seen for a long, long time. And now I believe I take questions. Can I just identify people? Please. You mentioned that um, you know the areas that lightning is most likely. Yes. Anybody hear me? Testing. You mentioned that um, you sort of have a good idea as to where the lightning is going to strike. Um, you also mentioned that you can also quantify the voltage or the kilowatts that actually each impact has on the earth. Um, my question to you is, is there a way to actually store um, the charge that gets hit into the conductors and then actually create, for example, like the wind farms who harness that energy and then reproduce to reuse it and monetize right. um, that sort of thing? Shall I take it question by question? Okay, it's a very good question, and it's one that one often gets. So here's the interesting thing about lightning. I've shown you spectacular examples of damage. And I guess, by the way, I have had conversations with people about um, methods of trapping the energy of a lightning, getting a current to flow, for example, in a coil and, and retaining it because you make it into a superconducting coil. You can do all those things. So here's the problem. So lightning is a very short phenomena, very high current. By the way, the average lightning strike, 30 kiloamps, the highest one measured 500, 500 kiloamps. The lowest lightning strike you'll ever measure about 3,000 amps because there just isn't enough charge otherwise for the process. So it's incredibly high currents. But the point is this. The lightning current flows for a very brief period of time. So the, the disgusting part of it is if I took this pen and I took a typical lightning strike to this pen and the current flowed through this pen after the lightning strike, it would be very hard to even detect a change in temperature. That's the problem. If it was wood, which isn't a conductor, because of the arcing, it would actually start blasting the wood apart because wood just doesn't conduct. So the key thing with lightning is the instantaneous power. 
the instantaneous product of voltage and current is very, very high. But here's the, the kicker. If you were able to capture every single lightning strike on planet Earth, you'd only get a few kilowatts. And that's the problem. So the key thing is, if you could capture every single lightning strike, you'd end up with about, about four kilowatts. So it's two stove plates, which is a hugely embarrassing thing to have to say. So the point, however, is that if, by the way, you could capture that energy and use it relatively instantaneously, so do something nasty with it quickly, then it could be quite interesting. But the average power, which is the useful power that we use typically in our daily lives, is a very modest value. But it just looks so bloody impressive. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Right, there's a question this side. Oh, sorry, the microphone wins. Um, thank I've you. never given a lecture drinking wine before. It's actually amazing. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful presentation and um, also a very entertaining one. For my sins, I've worked in the mining industry and being, having been to iron ore mines, they have a system in place where they kind of warn you when there's lightning coming. What I'd like to know is how do these lightning detection systems work and are they efficient in any shape, way, or form? An, an engineer always answers a question like that by saying, it depends. So the first thing is, you can actually subscribe to the South African Weather Services, and the South African Weather Services can actually give you a message on your phone to tell you exactly where the closest lightning is, just by the way. But the lightning detection networks, the lightning warning systems that you typically use in an industrial environment, there are, there are a couple of different types. The one that we've got in our building measures the electric field. The problem with that is if you only measure the electric field, you've got to be fairly close to the lightning to detect a significant change in the field. So the key thing there, you're measuring the ambient electric field. When it gets to a certain value, you blow a hooter and everybody runs away. Okay? The point is, often that's too late. So the better systems measure a combination of the electric and the magnetic component. In other words, they're detecting two things, the local electric field condition as well as the received radiation due to the current of a lightning strike somewhere over there. They are efficient. The good ones are very, very efficient. Can I just make one observation? Of course, you never use a system like that without also using personal vigilance in the sense that you need to pay attention to what's going on around you. So the most important thing to understand is that if lightning is within 20 kilometers of you, we consider that to be extremely high risk. 20 kilometers, extremely high risk. As I said, the one inquest I was involved in, the, the actual core of the storm, because we can measure it and we could see it. We could see it was over those mountains over there, 25 kilometers away, the guy struck stone dead. So typically what you're saying is 20 kilometers is high risk, 30 kilometers is marginal. The debate that everybody has, by the way, is you can use automatic systems, which I would support very strongly, because then you don't have human involvement. You've got to say the system says the following, therefore I need to evacuate the plant or get people off the golf course, as opposed to waiting for a bloke who says, I can, do, I can see from my screen that lightning's getting close, but if I push the hooter now, some bloke at the ninth hole is going to be really cross with me. And this is a real story. So the bloke says, I'm not going to push the hooter because this fellow is going to be so angry with me. So he neglects to push the hooter. The net result is dead people. Okay? Whereas if it's an automated system with all its faults, there's no human judgment. But you've got to base that also on the system and your personal vigilance. So you need to have very, very, very well-formulated policies in your work environment which allow people to understand how to treat those systems. I mean, the best example I was involved in was a chap who had to measure flue gases at a smelter at whatever time it was every afternoon. And the only reason I got involved was it didn't matter if there was a thunderstorm. You went up the chimney and you stuck a probe into the chimney, and the chimney was struck by lightning. There was damage, but it was, you know, just replace the clothing sort of thing. So these systems are good, but it depends which one you get. And I'm not going to stand here and talk about brand names, but they are very different. It's like any device you can get. You get really good ones and really bad ones. What you want is one which combines electric and magnetic and you know, the, the, the detecting the arrival of the electromagnetic radiation is not just the local electric field, but they work. So but you can, as I say, register with the weather services and get an update all the time. Okay, we have a question over here. And then there's a lady in the front. 
Um, I wanted to ask about one of the terms you used in one of the first slides was soil resistivity and the impedance value of that. Is there a correlation between soil types across the country and the ground lightning flash density? Also a very, very good question. The easy answer is no, but there is a correlation between the soil types and the kind of damage you get. So the drier the soil, the higher the resistivity, the higher the resultant voltage due to the current flow. The lightning is a function of the formation of cumulonimbus clouds. So at the end of the day, it's completely and utterly due to the cloud formation. So it's about the topography, what causes the, what causes the storm formation. That's where you get your lightning. The soil only tells us what happens after the strike. So there, there are many stories around that, but no. The fundamental issue is if you get, and that's why I made it almost flippant, you've got to have that thundercloud. So if you get a lot of thunderclouds in the area, you're going to get a lot of lightning. The soil is not important in that context. The results are, that's defined by what the soil tells you what happens next. So there's a question here on the right. Um, so, over here on the right. <laughs> um, so with something like climate change or global warming, um, would it be at all possible for that lightning density map to shift or change in some way? Yes, without question. And I suspect, and I, I mean, the problem is, you know, it's going to take a long, long time for us to really, really get confidence in those statements. But yes, the indication is even in the South African map, you compare our old map with the new one, already you can start seeing shifts. And it, I mean, so for example, if, if the current, if, 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 if ocean current temperatures change a bit, you can imagine more moist air which would rise going onto the escarpment, wherever it is on the planet, and you would be inclined to get a greater propensity of thunderclouds and therefore more lightning. We'll take uh... Hi, thank, thank you. Uh, my my the microphone actually... wins, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my question relates to that. With the increasing temperatures over Africa, there will also be increasingly dry soils. Do you think they will attract the lightning more and cause more felt fires? So if there's more lightning and the conditions are dry, you will get more felt fires. I'm looking, I mean, Alexis, you guys are involved in the African um, Center for Lightning and Electromagnetics. I have the privilege of being involved. It's based in Uganda, but it serves the whole of Africa. And there what we're trying to do is we're trying to deal with exactly that. So as you start getting more and more populations clustered, because remember that one of the biggest migrations of people in the world is into cities in Africa, you've got dry conditions. You've got tropical conditions, so you've got high thundercloud activity, high lightning activity anyway. The consequences of drier, hotter conditions, without question, will be more fire. You know, if you look at fire, it's one of the biggest results of lightning strikes, just to not do objects, but to the ground. And those fires can wreak absolute havoc. So there's no doubt, more lightning, dry conditions, more fires. That's a clear link for me. And there's that young lady as well. The hand was up first, I might emphasize. Um, you me can you hear me? Yeah. You mentioned how when a lightning branch strikes the ground, it creates like a plasma channel. Yes. How long does that last, and how does it dissipate? Okay. So what happens is, as you get to, this is like a fourth year lecture, but what happens is this: you get your negative charge. And remember what negative charge is. Effectively, it's just electrons that have been stripped out of neutral atoms and molecules. So you leave behind positive ions, and you've got these free electrons. Now the electrons are free to move. So the interesting thing is the negative downward leader is effectively these, these, these electrons being accelerated forward. The positive upward leader is kind of more interesting. What's actually happening is it's neutral atoms having electrons stripped and pulled away, leaving behind a growing number of positive ions as that moves up. So the interesting thing is the formation, what I was, all those photographs I was showing you are milliseconds, the formation process, the invisible process. The lightning return stroke, when the current actually flows, is tens to hundreds of microseconds. But what happens, of course, you get massive excitation of the air molecules, and that causes the lighting effect. And that's what, and that, 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 there's a residual component to that. The current has died long ago, and you still see that. I can't tell you how long that lasts for. But the current flows typically tens to hundreds of microseconds. You, you do what get, get what they call hot lightning, where you can get a current that flows typically for 2,000 microseconds, a few milliseconds, but that's quite rare but it's microseconds, tens to hundreds of microseconds. 
it's really shocking, but it's so impressive. Sometimes quick stuff is impressive. Yeah. All right, maybe time for one last question here. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure why I'm the only person thinking this. What am I supposed to do if it starts lightning around me and I'm in the open? What is the best way for me to avoid getting struck by lightning? You know how long I waited for that question. Um, <laughs> so the key thing is this. Let, let's talk about what we've learned. Yeah, yeah, the first one is this. The taller objects get struck, so you don't want to be tall. So you want to get down. And this is important. So you want to get down low. The second important thing is step potentials. You don't want to have a lot of contact with the ground. Okay? So you don't want to lie down. Because if you lie down, and we've got multiple cases of this where the lightning, you can see the burn marks on people who've passed away, and we've studied that. So you want to be low. You don't want to lie down. And the most advisable position is to crouch down with your feet together or sit cross-legged on the ground if you can't crouch for long. If you're nervous, it's also not a bad position to assume. So that's the bottom line. You crouch down, you get down on the ground, you keep yourself low. But the key thing is, you don't want to be out in the open in a thunderstorm. That's the bottom line. You just, if possible, get into a vehicle, get into a building, get out of the way. But if you're really caught out, reduce your probability of a strike, get down, crouch down low. 